Our dear viewers and listeners, we greet you all in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yet again, this is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to today's Bible study. Brought to you from Dominion Church International Buya. We invite you to invite someone else to join in for this life changing word encounter. But before we get into the word, let's take a moment and dedicate this moment to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you yes, for your grace, mm. for your peace, mm. for your comfort, mm. for your hope, mm. for your joy, mm. and for your life that is hidden in your word. Mm. Even as we delve into it, yes, these are manifesting mm. to bring a difference, mm. to shine in us, yes, Lord. to touch our generation, mm. and to glorify Jesus Christ. Mm. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Today's text is a singular one. We take it from the book of Romans. Chapter 6, verse 23. And the text reads as follows. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This text is a summation of what Paul began at the beginning of chapter 6. And he is like a painter who is now putting the final touches, bringing into scope all the contrasts before he finally lets this masterpiece shine. Now to remind you of what the theme is all about. Chapter 6 deals with the subject of who we were before Jesus Christ. And who we are now that we are in Christ Jesus. So the point he is driving home is that this that you have now is different from that that you had. Or putting it another way, who you were before, Jesus Christ is different from who you are now that you are in Christ Jesus. And just to recap what happened, he has clearly portrayed to us that before Jesus Christ or before we were saved, before we surrendered our lives to Jesus, you were a slave of sin. Basically, your mind, your heart, your affection, your will were all held in bondage by sin. So you were held captive to obey everything that sin represents. Now, but now that you are born again, there has been a miracle of regeneration. 
wabadde we cha magere cho kuzali bo murundi ogoku about your life kubulamu bo so you were liberated kati wanunu libwa you were set free watebwa from the slavery of sin okujja mu chikoligo che chibi and you have immediately been transferred bagirao ne bakuchusa to a new master and the new master that you have is our Lord Jesus Christ. So what has happened is you are previously a slave to sin. Now you become a slave to the master Jesus Christ. And this is the most wonderful experience that you can have. So you now being a slave to Jesus Christ places upon every one of us the mandate to obey his will. And the reason for that is that that is the only way we can experience life in its fullness. Our lives have now been surrendered to a master who loves us. A master who provides for all our needs according to his riches in glory. A master who guides us like a shepherd. A master who directs our footsteps. Who declares in his word that you will hear a voice. Say to you, this is the way, walk in it. But he does not just direct us, he walks with us every step of the journey. So every day of your life, every step of this journey, is an invitation to experience the master. So now what that brings into contrast is what the slave you were before and the slave that you are now. The slave you were before that slavery to sin leads to death. Now the slavery to Christ leads to eternal life. And he's not coming out of the blue to pronounce this. He has declared it over and over. If we turn our attention to verse 21 of chapter 6, he asks a question and says, what fruit did you have then in the things which you are now ashamed? And he adds that for the end of those things is death. Basically saying that these things that you used to have, that you used to boast in, had only one outcome. And that outcome was death. So the outcome of slavery to sin is death. And in verse 22, it says, But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness. And the end, in other words, the outcome of this is eternal life or everlasting life. Basically saying that the slavery to God leads to 
eternal life. So now he sums it all up. In verse 23, and he says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Our Lord. We will break this into two. The first half is where we will bring to you the bad news. And then in the second half, we will introduce to you the good news. You say you will never appreciate the good news until you have a correct perspective of the bad news. So the first half will focus on the wages of sin being death. And the second will be the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul begins by saying that the wages of sin is death. Now the word wages is the Greek word opsonion. Opsonion means to pay off. It is basically meaning you have done your job. You have served and now you get payment for your service. So this is a payment of wages for one who has worked hard to earn it. So wages is different from gift. When it comes to a wage, you merit it. Whereas when it comes to the gift, it is unmerited. So a wages Wages are based on your works. So you receive based on what you have done. So you are not paid more than what you have done. You are paid exactly the amount for which you have earned. So even where we work in the corporate world, for those of us who work in the corporate world, at the end of the month or at the end of a period, you get a paycheck. Or you get a credit to your account. They give you what you have earned for. So it is only on certain situations where they will give give you a bonus. But the bonus is not earned. The bonus is something else. What you are entitled to is what you have earned. And so you get exactly what you have worked for. You are paid what you deserve. So when the Bible says the, for the wages of sin, what that means is that you as an unbelieving sinner receive exactly what you have earned. So you have worked hard all your life and for sin you have worked to please sin. You, you have lived under the mastery of sin. You have lived for sin. You have been lawless all your life. You, you have been rebellious in the face of God. You have violated his law. At the end of it all, 
you now get what is just. Not more. Exactly what you deserve. And what you deserve is death. And I want that to sink in for all of us. Because many times we meet people and they say, I have not stolen. I have not killed any person. So basically they're looking at the gross sins. And they say, I've not done that, so I'm okay with God. But they forget that when it comes to sin, there are two arenas that come into Scorpia. So one arena deals with the inside of us. So what is on the inside? That involves our mind. That involves our heart. That involves our attitude. So you can actually sin inside. And then there is the second arena which is the outside. Those are the sins we commit or the acts that we engage in that violate the laws and the principles of God. Let me expound on the first category because the latter one is pretty much plain to all of us. The inside, the internal aspect. Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5 verse 27 to 28 he says you have heard it said of all that you shall not commit adultery. He says but I say to you in other words he sets the standard and he says whosoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in the heart. So, basically what Jesus is saying, the act has not been committed on the outside but it has been committed on the inside. And in the sight of God, that has been recorded as a sin of adultery committed. Jesus Father quotes and he says when you hate somebody in the heart, you have committed murder before God. Where do you get that? You may ask. Matthew 21, 5.21 to 22. Look at what he says. He says, you have heard it was said to those of old. Referring to Moses, the law of Moses. He says, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But he says in verse 22, But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. So you ask what judgment? The judgment he talked about in verse 21. The judgment coming upon murderers. And he says, and whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. And whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. The point Jesus wants to bring to us is that sin begins in the heart. So the arena that he addresses here is the internal arena. 
Now let's go to the external. And then look at the two aspects that come with the external. Because when we look at the external, many of us look at the sins we commit. But External has two aspects as well. It has the sins we commit and the sins we do not commit. Or let me put it this way. There is the sin of commission and this is doing evil that you are forbidden to do. This is where God says you shall not do this. And then you just go you deliberately consistently do what God said you should not do. No Basically, that is the sin of commission. But there is the sin of omission. Which we don't talk about. So this is the sin where you fail to do what God commanded you to do. So, in the example is James 4.17. Where he says, therefore, to him who knows what to do, good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So basically we sin both with our internal attitudes and as well as our external actions. But the result of all that and the result of everything is death. Basically what he's trying to say here when he says for the wages of sin is death every human member has accumulated a massive payment that is due because of their sin. And this Sin has a wage attached to it. And the wage to that sin is death. And this wage he's talking about, or the death that he brings to school, is not the first death. The death that he talks about here is the second death, which we find in Revelation chapter 20, from verse 14 to verse 15. And we will look at it in depth. But before we go to the second death, there is the first death. And the, nobody is spared from this one. Except when Jesus returns in our lifetime. But before Jesus returns, everyone experiences this. Even believers in Jesus Christ. So why? Because again it comes back to the law set in motion by God. When you go back to Genesis, the second chapter, verse 17, after God had created everything that was wonderful, and he places Adam in this garden, he gives him very clear instruction. He tells him what he should enjoy. And he gives him one very clear 
don't. Na mugambe chintu chimu cha tateke dwakola. Chapter 2 verse 17. Tulimu sule yoko vionyo wa kumi na musa. He tells Adam. Agamba Adam. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Na ye o mutio guo kumanye chivide chidunji. You shall not eat. Togulianga ko. Consider this. This guy had only one law to keep. Say this one you should not do. Enjoy everything else. But of this tree, don't touch. Don't eat. And what did he do? For God goes further and says, This is what is going to happen. For the day you shall eat from it. You will surely die. And what did Adam do? He ate from the very tree. God told him not to eat from it. And as a result of that, we began to die. So he died immediately. Instantly. He died in the spirit. Then emotionally, he began to be cut off from God. Physically, it was an eventuality. So when God comes to him and says, Adam, Adam, where are you in chapter 3? This is, a, he comes to a man who has been emotionally cut off. He comes to a person who has been physically cut off. He is spiritually unregulated. This fellowship has been savored. And here is Adam. Because of his rebellion. Brought death. And so what does God do? And the scriptures tell us that then the Lord, out of mercy, out of his goodness, takes the initiative to restore this relationship. He killed an animal and clothed them. And this animal was the picture of Jesus Christ. This was the foreshadow of the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And that is Jesus Christ. For when John the Baptist saw him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he said, I did not know him, but the one who sent me baptizing said to me that the one on whom the Spirit shall descend that is the one. He, it is he. Yo, yo. And this is wonderful news to all of us. Because God has provided a solution. And this solution is Jesus Christ. Yes, Christ. But also it brings to our understanding of how sin is treated before God. The disobedience of one brought death to many. It brings everybody in scope. You see, sometimes we don't have the quiet perspective of how our sin appears before a holy God. But if we are to take God seriously, then we have got to see sin for what it is. Because he goes further. When you go down the pages of the Bible, to Ezekiel 18, and he says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son. 
and he says the soul who sins will die. And why is he saying that? Because they had come to an understanding which was albeit erroneous to say that the the, the fathers eat, do the sin, commit the sin. And now the sons or the sons' sons bear the burden of what the fathers have done. Now he comes to correct that impression and says, no, the soul that sinned, that one will die. Why does it say all souls are mine? Basically, he's saying all souls are accountable to him. Every soul will bear an account before God. And the soul that sins will die. Paul comes to us in the book of Romans and tells us that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And because of that, because of committing fragrant sin before God, in verse 21, he says, they exchange the knowledge of God for a lie and worshipped a creature. And he says, so God gave them over in judgment to the lusts of their hearts and sexual impurity. Verse 24. And God was not yet done. In verse 26, the Bible says he gave them over to degrading passions, to homosexuality and lesbianism. Even when they continue to sin, finally in verse 28, the scripture tells us that God gave them over to a depraved mind. And the result of that was sin in increase. So everything that we see in our world today, all the wickedness, all the greed and evil, the murder, the strife, the deceit, the malice, the gossip. People, people hating God. People becoming arrogant and boastful. People becoming inventors of evil. Disobedience to parents. In verse 32, he gives us what the end will be. And he says, those who practice such things are worthy of death. So the judge has now hit the gavel to the earth. The verdict is the soul that sins will die. In Romans 5.12, he says, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin. Basically, sin paved the way. Death came in as the companion. Where you have sin, there is death. Sin and death are like Siamese twins. You cannot separate them. So where sin reigns, death reigns. And that's why in Romans 8, verse 2, he says, For 
the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Kiva tugamba rumi munana satunti eteka eriye dembe liri mu Kristo Yesu has freed me from the law of sin and death. Ya tuwe dembo kuva muteka eriye kibi nokufa. So sin and death are walking side by side. They are not they, they can't be separated. So what begins as a last? James tells us that after last has conceived, it, it gives birth and it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings death. James 1.15 so we see this chain coming throughout the Bible. And the just payment for this sin is nothing other than death. And here it's very clear. Now I've met several people who say, but that's not just. You see, the sins vary. Yes. Sins do vary. Hebrews tells us, chapter 2 and verse 2, that every transgression and disobedience receives a just penalty. So God is just. Ultimately, it will be death. But in the same vein, God does not give the same punishment for every sin. I actually believe hell will have those places that are hotter than others. Why? Because everyone is accountable for something. The greater the accountability and then the greater will be the responsibility. Praise be to God. To you, for you to understand that, we need to go back to Matthew chapter 10. When Jesus was sending out his disciples to go and preach everywhere within the land of Israel, he adds these remarks. Verse 14 to 15. He tells them, whoever does not receive you, nor heeds your words as you go out of that house or that city shake the dust off your feet. It's the latter part that I'm interested in. He says, truly I say to you it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than that city. Now look at what happened. The land of Sodom and Gomorrah we understand was a land that had sin to its zenith. Sexual sin was in a banner. And God sent judgment on this land. He caused fire to rain upon the city. And destroyed everyone that was there. Now Jesus is saying that on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for the people who were destroyed then. But these ones who have had the gospel and have rejected it, he says it is going to be intense. It, this is going to be multiplied. Why? Because they, the others did not hear the gospel that you are hearing. So there is a greater accountability for those of us that have had 
the gospel. Why? Because the greater the light, then the greater the sin when that truth is rejected. Although actually he goes on to explain that there will be a greater judgment. In Matthew chapter 11 verse 20 when he begins to make the declaration on the cities he begins to denounce the cities that rejected the gospel. And these are cities what had seen the miracles that he performed. And yet did not repent. He goes on to say, Woe unto you, Chorazin. And you, Bethsaida. Now, when he says, Woe unto you, he's simply trying to say that you are damned, you are judged, you are cursed. Why, why was that? Because these were cities within the neighborhood of Capernaum. Capernaum was his headquarters. These, these were the cities where the gospel was being sent from. He goes on to say, for if the miracles that had occurred in Tyre and Sidon which occurred in you. They would have repented in sacrament. Uh, what is he trying to say? <laughs> and he says, nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment. And he turns to Capernaum and says, and you Capernaum will not be exalted to heaven. You? you will descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which had occurred in you, he says it would have remained. <laughs> and he says, nevertheless, I said to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Jesus here is trying to paint the picture for us that there will be levels of judgment. The severity will depend on the exposure to light. Now you may say that is an opportunistic scripture. How about Luke 12? Where he narrates the parable of two servants or two slaves. One who was faithful and sensible to his master. And Jesus now says, Blessed is that slave whom the master finds doing the will of the master. And he says he will put him in charge of his possession. Now, he goes on to say, but if the slave says in his heart, my master is a long time coming, and he begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, he begins to eat and get drunk. This is like, no, this is not coming soon. So he begins to indulge himself. He gets into this rebellious attitude. He does the will of his life. Everything he does is to please himself. Jesus added in verse 46 and said that the master of the slave will come on a day when he does not expect him. and at an hour he does not know. He will cut him in pieces and assign him with the place 
with the unbelievers. And that assigned place is hell. Now, every false believer, everyone that does not do the will of the master will be assigned to that place. And the, he goes on to verse 47 and he says that slave who knew his master's will in other words he did receive the message. He knew what the master required. He said he will receive many lashes. So, you see what is happening? He knew the will, did not do it. Severe punishment. So now you ask, how about me who doesn't know? Ignorance is not innocence. Verse 48, he gives us the one who did not know the will. And he goes on to say in his assessment, but he committed deeds worth of punishment. But his punishment was lesser. Why? Because in 48, Jesus adds, for everyone to whom much is given, much is required. And to whom they entrust much, they will ask for more. So, what we paint here is the fact that this will be classified based on what we know. Hebrews chapter 10, he says, for if we go on sinning willfully, and this is a and concept of somebody who knows the truth, but continues to go against this truth. He's putting off repentance and saying, no, my time will come. He says, if you go on sinning after you know the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying experience, a terrifying expectation of Judgment. and the fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. Why? Because you know the truth. You have, but you are now trampling upon the blood of Jesus. You, you, are, you are insulting the spirit of grace. So what is happening is this knowledge of truth that comes to us should spur us to action should spur us to obedience. Why? Because there is a day where God will judge all men. And it is a terrifying experience, the Bible tells us, to fall into the hands of a living God. Because look at what the Bible paints this concerning the judgment or the second death. When it talks about the wages of sin being death, the picture is here. In Revelation 20, John writes to us and says the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the death. The dead were in it. And they were judged each according to his works. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And he says, this is the second death. And he adds and says, everyone not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, this is not good news at all. 
But John is painting the picture for us. He says there was a white throne that he saw. And he said, I saw the dead, the small and the great, standing before God. So it doesn't matter your status in life. We will all stand before the throne of God. And the Bible says, and the books were open. What does that mean? God is keeping an impeccable record of every individual of what you are doing by commission and by omission of what is being done internally or externally. He says the books were open and another book was open which is the book of life. So, so it is not just the books of what you have done. The, this book, the book of life. Now if your name is not in this book you are going into the lake of fire. So, this is, should be very clear to us. Of, and when we stand there, you will not stand there with the judge, with an attorney. You know, we want the lawyers. We pay them to standing for us. You not have a lawyer. Romans 3.19 tells us that every mouth will be closed. When the record is opened, you will know that what you are getting is just. Those are the wages of sin. But but let's flip it for, over to the good news. He says, but the gift of God. The news is that God has a gift. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. It, you, it, doesn't, it is not something you merit. It is an act of mercy and grace. And he says the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Let me paint a picture for you. Why is it Jesus Christ? He is, you need then to go to Colossians 2.14. The Bible says having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. Which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way. Having nailed it to the cross. Now, here you need to understand what is happening. What does it mean? What is happening here? When a person was being crucified, this is what was happening. So they would say, or let me first take it back before the crucifixion. When you committed a crime, let's say you stole something. So you, they would write on the code, this is what you have done. And then they would write down what the sentence is. So when you were put in jail, it was very clear what you had done and what this punishment you are serving. So when it came to you being crucified, this is what happened. On the cross where you were being crucified, they would put an inscription of what you had done to deserve this death. Now, this is what Paul is trying to help us understand. That, that inscription was the certificate 
of date. Ibigambe vyo yeyalinga certificate ye banja consisting of the decrees of the what you had offended. Mweba wandika emisango je wali omenye in order for you to deserve this death. Oli oke otibwe. Now when it comes to Jesus Christ. Katibwe tutunulia Yesu Christo. Of course we see that the only thing that was written was that he is the king of the Jews. Omusango gwe kwe itakabaka waba yuda. But Paul brings it deeper for us. Nate Paul achizimbulu kusa. When he says that there was this record of charges against us. What he wants us to understand that the handwriting of requirements that was against us was not what the people were saying. It is what was happening in the spiritual realm. Because in the spiritual realm, there was a handwriting, a record of all the sin of humanity being written against him. That was deserving of the death. So the wages of the sin of mankind was death. And that is why he that had no sin had to die. So the written code that was against us related to our sin nature and everything associated with this sin. So all the sins of omission and commission, all the internal sin were in this handwriting. So this certificate of date was the certificate of the date of sin against us. And so this is what was now nailed to the cross. And this is what he did our with. So when he died, or when the person died, this is what would happen. They would then go to the judge, and the judge would pronounce and say, Tetelestai. In other words, this has been paid in full. Similarly, if you went to prison and served your term, then they would bring back this code to the judge and say, this one was sentenced for this man, this period for committing this crime. And the judge would write, Tetelestai, paid in full. And then you would be set free. John tells us in John 19.30 that the last words of Jesus when he hung on the tree he said it is finished. Basically the father took every sin posted it on this certificate of death and at the cross of Calvary on this invisible certificate of date for sin it was made for everyone for whom Jesus Christ died for. So his death then purchases the forgiveness for all our transgression. So all our offenses are paid in full. Jesus took our sin and nailed the certificate of our date so, so when we believe in what he has done, then we receive the forgiveness that comes 
because of his death. Now, this was invisible, so you couldn't see it. But heaven saw it. And what you now need is to throw yourself at the mercy and grace of God. Believe in Jesus Christ. Trust him. Commit your life to him. And receive him. You're receiving not what you deserve. You receive what you don't deserve. And that is the grace of God. And therefore Paul tells us that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you are there and have never received this grace, you can get it today. You remember you have had the gospel shared with you. That means the light has shone in. So that means there is a greater responsibility for you to respond. So if you have never received Jesus in your life, today you can receive him. Today your sins will be forgiven and you will become born again. Why don't you say this prayer with me? Say God of heaven, creator of the universe, I stand before you sinner I stand before you having lived all my life for sin. Here I am, Lord. Save me. I believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world. And he died for my sins. Today I receive him as my Lord and Savior. I believe that he rose again from the dead. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me and empower me to live according to your will. Lord, I thank you for this free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you say that prayer from the bottom of your heart, God has saved you. Call the name on the screen. Tell us what God is doing in your life. We would like to celebrate what God has begun to do right now. And your life will never be the same because you have moved from death to life. Now to you the believer in Jesus Christ, you who know the truth, you who has been submitted to this life-changing grace of God. Submit the members of your body as slaves to God and see what God will do with your life. It's been a pleasure having you today with us today. From Dominion Church, yes, saying shalom. God richly bless you.